welcome. This is my guest, Mr. Joy McCausland. He is the director of the Charlotte Reilly Reader's Information Service. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing very good. Great. Tell you a little bit about Mr. McCausland. He's the director of the Charlotte Reader's Information Service. He's born and raised in Toronto. Right. Mm -hmm. Executive of the SNH Motivation. Mm -hmm. And um, February the 14th, 2004, you started this program on Access 21 call the readers right? and you're a member of the board of directors at access 21 correct let's talk about the Chris program mm -hmm. what about the Chris pro what what made you want to develop the Chris program well first of all I like to work with people mm -hmm. and in Detroit I, I was on a reading service in Detroit mm -hmm. before we moved here and so when he moved here I tried to find a service that I could read on mm -hmm. and there wasn't one there was one at CPCC up until like 10, 15 years ago, but they canceled it, which is a reading service to blind people, which is what we do. Mm. And so uh, I decided to do start our own. And then I asked uh, the Lions Club what they could do to help support us. Mm. And they said, well, we'll do this. We'll buy all the machinery you need to get started. So they bought us all the microphones and everything else to get That's us started. Great. Because it's, it's really a necessity. And one of the things that we used to do in Michigan, which we do across the country with a lot of the other services, is they provide a radio, mm -hmm. an FM radio, so they can get the special station. Okay. And so I didn't want to do that. So I thought, maybe why don't we do it through television? Because most everybody has a TV. Correct. Regardless of whether they are blind or they have you know, physical disabilities or not, most everybody has a TV. And so that's why we got a hold of TV21, and they said, we'll be glad to have you come and work with us. So we started back in 2004. What's the biggest thing that you have seen as far as your growth within the program? Well, the, the telephone calls I get are, are very interesting mm -hmm. um, because we have our telephone number on the screen for people to read. But it's, it's interesting because people call and say how much they enjoy it that they're glad that something like that is being done for them. And one of the things we also do is we try to get people in who are, uh, for instance, we had a young man from Matthews area okay. who was legally blind. He couldn't see stoplights, he couldn't see street signs or anything. And he heard about an organization in China that was developing a system so people could see again, depending on what their problems were. And he called them, uh, and he got an appointment. And so he and a buddy went around, they had golf tournaments and all sorts of things to make money to go, because it costed like $40,000 for him to go. And so he went, him and his wife went, and China now is the number one country in the world for stem cell research. Uh, and Australia is the one, number one country in the world that uses it more than anywhere else. So the Australians moved up to China to help the Chinese develop the program. And he went there. And they did, gave him six shots of uh, this wonderful serum. And he started to see. And he thought, oh, it's, it's not going to be that easy. Mm. When he got home, he now can see street signs. Mm. He now can see stoplights. His eyes are almost as good as a normal person's. That's great. And uh, the stem cells are what did it. And unfortunately, uh, in this country, they won't allow stem cells to be used to help people, which is sad. Can they ever figure out why? What's the purpose, reason why? Well, the biggest purpose is they, sit, they don't feel that that's good to take somebody else's stem cells. Mm -hmm. We don't have to. You can take the person's stem cells of themselves and put them into your system. So you don't have to. But the, the biggest problem is the FDA doesn't want them because they can't make any money. Oh, okay. And all the pharmaceutical companies don't want them because they can't, they can't produce a stem cell in a bottle. In other words, the FDA will only approve things that the pharmaceutical companies can manufacture. Correct. And so they can't manufacture stem cells. They come from a person's body. Animals have stem cells too. You could use animal stem cells. 
And of course, they've developed them to such an extent now that one of the hospitals here in town, or in, in the country, put a finger back on a person who lost it. Oh, okay. it's, a, it's a serviceman who lost his finger over in the overseas. And he came back and they asked him, would you mind if we tried to put a, your fing a finger back on there? He said, no, I love it. So they did it with stem cells. And now you'll never know he had a problem. He just, his finger is now complete. God, it's amazing. <laughs> Absolutely amazing what's going on. Oh, yes, yeah. So that, that, that we do interviews with people. The young man who, who, who went on that trip, uh, we interviewed him when he came back. And he was so excited about how well it had done and so on and so forth. Also, there's a young gal up in, oh, just outside of Huntersville, six years of age, has been blind since birth. And her dad decided that he was going to take her to China and talk to the young man who had been to China about all the problems and all the things that he's got to look forward to. And he's over there now. And when he gets back, I asked him if I could call him and maybe have him down on our program to tell people just how things went. Hmm. Because I think it's important for people to realize there are good things going on with stem cells around the world, but with not here in this country. Right. And that's sad. Hmm. So we started the service here back in 1904, or pardon me, 2004. So we start our seventh year in February, February 14th. Okay, um, what time do you come on and come on Time One Access 21? Well, we start our programs at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. Uh, we go for an hour and a half, and we read the morning paper uh, from beginning to end. One of the things that we are asked to do by an audience where I was a guest speaker is, is to do the obituaries for the people who are blind and disabled because they don't know their friends have passed on uh, because the blind people can't read papers. So we do that, and they're very pleased with that. So we do things as best we can to help those people. What type of, I mean, um, I know you talk was there a reason why you never wanted to read the obituary in the past? Try to actually. Well, it's just one of those things you didn't think of. You know, we never thought of using the obituaries. The, the group I was with up in Michigan, we never used the obituaries. Mm -hmm. And uh, once I got down here and they said that at the meeting that I attended, I thought, that's a fantastic idea. Correct. And, and it makes a big difference. So people. Uh, so people will know that maybe their friends have passed on. Do you um, have volunteers, and what's mm -hmm. the process someone coming with volunteer? Well, usually uh, a volunteer, they usually call because we have a telephone number on the screen that if you're interested in volunteering, give it a call, give that number a call, and that's my home phone number, uh, my business phone number too. Uh, and so we talk, and uh, then I have them come down here and visit us. For instance, today, a young gentleman came in who wants to read for us. Correct. And uh, he was really excited about it. And I was going to give him a chance to read today because I didn't think Jay Rao, one of our readers, was going to arrive. Okay. But she arrived. And so we, we let her do the reading. And he was really excited, though, but he was a little nervous. Mm -hmm. But what I usually try to do is try to get them on the air as soon as I can for, for one show. And uh, because there's always two people to read, Correct. the person that's going to read with you will help you okay. uh, to, uh, you know, try to do the right things. And that's, so it works out pretty well. What type of other things do you want to do for the CRIS program in the future? Well, well one of the things that we started, which was, is called Novels at Noon. Uh, every noon hour at 12 o'clock, we read a novel. Uh, and we started off with uh, some really interesting mo uh, model uh, novels, and people really like it. Mm -hmm. I had a call from a gentleman who said, I want to tell you how much I enjoy that Novels at Noon. He said, I happened to turn the TV on, and there was that Novels Correct. at Noon on. And he said, now, at 12 o'clock, every day, I go upstairs and I get all the people who are sitting around doing nothing and make them come down and watch uh, mm -hmm. that program. And listen to that program. So, uh, and that's in an old folk song. To know that you're making an impact mm -hmm. in these individuals' life, how does that make you feel? Good. It really makes me feel good. One of the things I've done all my life is try to help people because that's just what I enjoy about life. Right. Uh, hey, a little bit about 
about George. Um, <laughs> I, I, I know you recently um, your wife. Yes, she passed on. She passed on. Um, how much of an impact was she in your life, and how, how is it after? Well, it's very difficult. Uh, we were married 55 years. Uh, we had some ups and downs, as every married couple does. But we got along really well together. Uh, we both understood each other better. Mm -hmm. uh, and I used to travel a lot. When I, uh, the business I was in was the sales and marketing business, oh, okay. and it was called the incentive business, the motivation business. And I used to go around and help salesmen sell programs to all the Ford divisions, to Chrysler, anything, insurance companies, Schlitz Beer, mm -hmm. all of those people. And uh, I used to travel a lot. I used to tra I traveled the world. Uh, I've been to almost every country in the world except Australia <laughs> and uh, India. It just, it's too long a flight for either one of those countries, and I refuse to go 18 hours on an airplane. But uh, I've been to most countries of the world. That's where I got a lot of feeling for people. Mm -hmm. uh, people around the world are no different than people here, except we tend to not know how to relate to them. Well, relating to people around the world is be yourself. Right. Don't try to be something you're not. Okay. And, it, and they, they, they enjoy you. But for a lot of people around the world, they have had a sort of a negative effect from Americans because they always walk around like uh, they own the country. Well, they don't. Okay. If, if those people came to our country and did that, our people would really get upset. Yeah, right. So yeah. if you just be yourself, for instance, they'll complain about the rooms, the size of the room they're sleeping in, maybe the hot water maybe the towels. I mean, as they tell them when they used to do that and complain and I happened to be there, i say, next time they're having a trip, why don't you go to the Holiday Inn around the corner from it? Then you wouldn't have to worry about all these things. If George had the opportunity to turn back the hands of time, mm -hmm. what would you have done in your life? Probably I would have, uh, well, I really have done a lot in my life. I've enjoyed my life. Uh, one of the things that got me started was uh, my dad was a good friend of a gentleman who was the minister at the Fred Victor Mission in Toronto, where I'm from. And so we started going to church there. Correct. Uh, he was a great guy. He used to take like eight or ten of us every year to away in the summer. He'd take us skiing up because he had a beautiful cottage up north. And he, he really helped me. Because he said to me one day, George, I'd like you to come and help me in the, with church mm -hmm. service. I said, what am I going to do? I don't know what to do. He said, no, I just want you to have the, be looking after the lights, turn the lights off when we have a song, and turn them back up when we're singing. So, yeah. off. so I did that for a while. And then he said to me, George, I need some help. I said, what do you need? He said, I need someone to help me with the people. Because it's a mission. There used to be a lot of drunks coming in. They were going to sleep there or have dinner there, and they were in bad shape. Mm -hmm. And they do crazy things, like lay down in the urinals and fall asleep, oh, okay. and all those crazy things. And he needed someone to help get rid, get them back to normal. Right. And so I did that, and I learned a lot about life and people, because mm -hmm. uh, there's some really nice people who have problems like that. Correct. Uh, well, nice people have a lot of problems, and I, I think you, you can relate to that, too, mm -hmm. as I can. And so I helped a lot of them. I did things with them that, that they'd say, why are you being so nice to me? I said, I'm not being nice to you. That's just the way I am. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> and so that's how it got me started. And one of the things at the mission, at Christmas time, we used to get white gifts from all the churches in the city of Toronto, okay. and they would send them down to the mission, and we'd give them to people in our, in our area. But with the packages we took to the door, once we rang the bell and the door was open, and if there's a smell of booze, we didn't leave them anything. Okay. Uh, and that was our way of showing them that we have nothing against what you do. We just don't like allow you to drink and expect something for free because you, can't have, you don't have any money to buy anything. It's not our fault. So we, it made a big difference in my life knowing that there are things that you have to force on people in a nice way Correct. rather than standing up and saying you're stupid or whatever the terminology might be <laughs> that goes on today. <laughs> mm. 
And so we started that, and, and from that point on, I, I, I kind of liked working with people. Mm. And I got involved in coaching, and that, that's mm. working with, with kids. And uh, I got involved in teaching, and I taught Bible class for many years. Uh, uh, and, and one of the things I did with Bible class, I tell everybody, I used to make the kids, a boy and a girl, do the ser service for next Sunday. Oh, okay. I wouldn't let them use the books because that's ridiculous. Some guy, that's somebody's opinion of what's written in the Bible. I want them to learn themselves mm -hmm. what's there. And what I asked them to do is take any paragraph in the Bible, any psalm, anything, and relate it to today. The things they came up with would shock you. Mm -hmm. I learned more about what they did and how they the thought of the Bible than I ever knew existed. And I had been to church and I attended Sunday school and so on. So it was really interesting, and it, it really built up my class. My class went from 20 to 65 kids on Sunday morning, and that was unbelievable. I couldn't take any more. Where do you get that passion from as far as dealing, working with kids, children? Well, because I think they're the easiest people to work with. And, and, and the reason why they're easy is because all you have to do is show a little respect for them, mm. enjoy them. Uh, yes, they're going to have faults. Yes, they're going to make mistakes, but don't make an issue of them. Only if they, for instance, would swear, then I would make an issue of it. Or if they did something wrong, like stole something from somebody in the class. But other than that, no. They were part of my family as far as I was concerned. Although I had four kids of my own, but okay. they became part of my family. And, and that's the way I treat kids today, and I did when I was coaching. When something would come up, there would be a problem in coaching, I would try to find a way to get to their parents, and their parents and I and the young player would sit down and we'd discuss the problem. I, I see such a, when I, when I see you come at the studio, sir, mm -hmm. um, you have such a high spirit. Where is that coming from? I mean, it, with all the things that's going on around, I always see a great attitude mm -hmm. and you're such an inspiration every time I see you. Um, what, Thank you. What, what drives George to be? Well, one of the things that I'm very fortunate is I am 77 years of age. Mm. I'm still in pretty good health Correct. for a young guy. And that, the reason why I am is because being that way, I don't let a lot of things bother me. Even when I was younger or, or going to school or even in sports, you know, if you did something wrong on my team, I would tell you and hope you would change. But I didn't make an issue of it. And so even when I had, uh, oh, 200 people working for me, if, if we had a problem with someone, I'd bring them into the office and we'd talk about it. Correct. But I wouldn't yell and scream at them. So, so I learned to be rather, not, not complacent, but very, very calm. Mm -hmm. And that's made a big difference in my life. How important is it to, with dealing with the children to, to listen to them? I mean, because I know a lot of times we talk at them, but we don't listen. Should, everybody should listen to their children. Uh, I would listen to the kids that were playing for me. I'd listen to the kids in Bible class. I would listen to kids on the street because they would come up and talk to me. And the reason why is I wanted to learn from them. Mm -hmm. You can learn a lot from young people if you listen to them because they're learning themselves and they're very proud of what they just learned. Mm -hmm. And if they, you allow them to tell you that, they'll keep telling you more and more as you go along. And the things that they have done and what, the way they look at life is so much better than the way we used to. Because they, they, they're, they're, they can do things like that. And that impresses me. and always has. In fact, one of the uh, teams I had when we were living in Chicago was just a peewee team. And it was hockey because I love hockey. Being from Canada, everybody likes hockey in Canada. Right. <laughs> And we, we uh, had a tournament in, in Illinois, uh, and we won the tournament. Okay. We beat a Swedish team that came over to be part of the tournament. Mm -hmm. And the coach from the Swedish team came up to me and he said, George, I must congratulate you. And I said, yeah, because we beat you, right? He said, no, no. I have never seen players play their position so well. Mm -hmm. And that was really impressive to me mm -hmm. because that's what I taught them, play the position correctly and you'll be very successful and they did play the things right and they won and and people noticed that and I think kids notice that too uh, one of the other things which uh, I mentioned before I think I did anyhow when I was when I was teaching 
whenever I walked down the halls at school <laughs> and people would be holding hands or hugging, they'd stop when they saw me because they knew I didn't agree with it. I think that's important. And how did it feel to you to, to have gained that respect from those children? Well, I, I didn't gain, I earned it because I wasn't, I wasn't nasty with them. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't a gain or a win or a loss. It was the kids enjoyed that because right. they knew that I said something that I, that I meant it. Too often people say things and don't, go, don't abide by them. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, if, if you say no, that means no. If you say yes, that means yes. And I think that's what kids need. George, I'd like to, class, I'd like to thank you for coming on the show. And um, anytime you want to come back, you're more than welcome. Just continue to um, do what you're doing inside, you know, as far as the community. Sure. Because you're a very good inspiration. Thank you. You're, you're, I mean, you're, you're, if you have one thing that you can say to the community, what would you say? I'd say give me a million dollars. <laughs> What would you do with that million dollars? What I'd would you help, do with I'd it? help a lot of kids. Huh? I'd help a lot of kids. So helping people, that's what you really love. I about. enjoy that. I think it's so rewarding because you see results when you help people. And that's important to me. Having been an athlete all my life, the results are what were important to me, like doing well or winning or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when, when I do that nowadays, I look for that result. I look for people to change, and they, and they usually do. And I'll let you answer some of my phone calls at home that <laughs> you can find how, how, how enjoyable it is for most people. You know, I, I just want to thank you for coming on the show. I, I, I just applaud the things that you do, mm -hmm. not only in the studio, but as far as in the community. You know, and I'm, I'm saying continue doing what you're doing because you're a blessing not only to thank myself, you. but a lot of people. You're an inspiration. Well, I enjoy it. Thank you. you. Know. And just continue to do it. Um, audience, um, thank you for watching the show. And um, next week we'll have another exciting guest. Thank you.